My name is Matthew Todd and welcome to Inside the Scale Up. This is the podcast for founders and executives in tech looking to make an impact and learn from their peers within the tech business. We lift the lid on tech businesses, interviewing leaders and following their journey from startup to scale up and beyond, covering everything from developing product market fit, funding and fundraising models to value proposition structure and growth marketing. We learn from their journey so that you can understand how they really work, the failures, the success, the lessons along the way, so that you can take their learnings and apply them within your own startup or scale up and join the ever growing list of high growth UK SaaS businesses. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Pleased today to be joined by Nishith Patak, founder, CEO of WeSaw.ai. Great to have you here today. Thanks, Matt. Very nice to be here too. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation today. I think it's going to be an interesting one. But to kick things off, as I always like to do, I like founders to introduce themselves, introduce their business so they can give our audience a bit of context about what it is that you're you're working on at the moment. Right. So uh, my background uh, is quite varied. I am technically qualified to be a founder because I'm an engineering dropout. So I did drop out of engineering after three weeks. I realized it wasn't the right profession for me to be in. Went on to study and become a chartered accountant. I studied accounting and taxation for two and a half years. Didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, moved on. Uh, That was the time when um, in the late 90s, the dot-com boom was going on. And something caught my attention, which was basically about the valuation of companies. And I was growing up in India, which was booming in the late 90s. And I was looking at the stock market very keenly. And I saw that there was a company called Tata Steel, which is part of the famous Tata conglomerate. And there was TCS or the Tata Consulting Services, which is a software arm. And TCS was valued multiple times Tata Steel. And I said, that's not what they teach us in accounting. In accounting, it's all about assets, which is your plant and machinery and all the tangible stuff. So what is it that is leading to this insane difference in valuation? And as I kind of read more about it in my late teens, early 20s, I figured out it was something called people. And and that's where my interest in that area arose. And I, I ended up doing an MBA in HR. And I've stayed on in HR since then. Uh, worked in uh, blue chip organizations like Nestle, HSBC, did a consulting stint with uh, with Aeon um, in, in rewards consulting, and then yeah. moved to the Middle East where I worked with three banks. And then about four years ago, I tell people it was my midlife crisis, which is where I started questioning what we do and why we do and why hasn't HR changed. And that's yeah. where I decided to address that through technology. And that's basically how we sort of came up. Yeah, yeah, I've seen an interesting journey experience and, and career in the HR sector. So when you say that you know HR hadn't really changed, things hadn't moved on, what were some of the things that you were kind of seeing as a, a frustration at that time? Right. So uh, HR is a very slow moving field, right? So uh, there are some areas in HR which have kind of caught on predominantly, if I were to say, diversity and inclusion and well-being. But other than this, the core of HR, as we look at it, the way recruitment happens, the way people are assessed, the way employee appraisals happen, even the way employee surveys run, there hasn't been much of a change. Uh, So most of these processes were set up in the post-World War II era, primarily from the U.S. Army. And uh, they were good for a command and control kind of a system, but that's not how we work. We work as a network of networks within an organization. And people don't just go up and down a hierarchy. They work across uh, hierarchies. They collaborate with each other. And that's where things like performance management, for example, absolutely come crashing down. Because in, in most of the organizations, performance management is still a contract between employee and manager. There's nothing else beyond that. Um, yeah. So so there were a lot of these things that we wanted to change. I started changing a lot of these things in my last corporate role, uh, which was uh, with Commercial Bank of Dubai. Unfortunately, technology let us down because there wasn't enough enablement that I could find through technology. And most of the things were being done offline in Excel sheets. You know how it works most of the places, right? So so that's how it was. And uh, that's where the need to kind of have the right technology behind some of these processes came up. Yeah, so, so what were some of those 
processes? What did they look like then that you kind of had to resort back to Excel to to try and implement? So uh, I'll give you some specific examples. So performance management typically is defined by a goal setting process. Then you come back after six months, typically do a mid-year check. And then at the end of the year, you fill out a form, you assign the rating. Most of the times you're frustrated by the rating because you're expecting something else. And there's a yep. bell curve and, and all of these kind of things. In real life, there is a lot that goes on in between these phases, which basically corresponds to performance planning, right? So it's not enough for me to state in my goal sheet that I will do revenues of $10 million. The question is, how will I get there? Yeah. What are the milestones? What are the stepping stones, building blocks in order to get there? Whose support do I need? Because there is interdependence at work, right? So I can't do a lot of it just by myself. I need other people to enable me. So there is performance planning, which is missing in, in most of the software. There is uh, interdependence, which is absolutely completely missing in, in literally all software out there. Absolutely. I've seen that firsthand, that that missing gap that you say there with independence, thinking back to, you know, previous life as an employee working alongside people. I've seen all sorts of those systems implemented. Managers struggle to even help you set goals that are relevant for more than the day that they're written on, but certainly they're very individualised, never account for any kind of team interdependencies as far as I've seen at least. Correct. And and that, but that's not how we work. So there is yeah. a big gap between the actual way we work and how performance gets measured. In fact, uh, at most what will happen in some organizations, they will have a competency-based rating or a values-based rating and teamwork or collaboration in some shape or form could come in there. That doesn't determine at the end of the day the bonus that I get, for example. You know, in, yeah. in financial services, in banks, for example, bonus is a big deal. Uh, I, I somehow sometimes joke that no banker worth her salt works for fixed salary. They work for the yeah. bonus. And and if you have to defend a bonus decision or if you have to make it clear and if you have to make it less subjective, you need to get these things sorted out. So, so obviously, uh, you need to have a strong process behind it. It is not just about the process, but also about how we do it, right? So if you right. if you take a typical organization and how it works, people spend between six hours to two days every year in the performance management process in terms of the time they give to the process. Sometimes it's even more. Why do people spend so much time and what do they actually do in that time? They are not necessarily using it for value-added activities like giving feedback, coaching, identifying what could be done better. They're spending a lot of this time time trying to retrieve information because information sits in many different places. You have information in emails, in Teams or Slack, in Excel sheets, in notepads, in in all sorts of places. And because the year-end appraisal is an important enough activity, People spend this time trying to retrieve information. And when I was in my first job, I learned something called lean. And this part of the activity is what gets defined as waste. Right. You shouldn't be doing it. Because there is no value that you add by finding information, retrieving information and writing it down. So the way people kind of work with it is you take a very long pause and then you come back and spend two days trying to write a form. And, and look at it this way. Performance management is a tool. It's, it's something to help you. Like I, I would say it's something like a treadmill. You can't have a treadmill and get on it three days in a year. No. Right. So if you're using a treadmill three days a year, it's the same thing we are doing in performance management in all, in all organizations. It's not something that's going to make you fitter. You may just be worse off if you're using it three yes. days in a year. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely needs to be that continual process of learning, development, evolution, doesn't it? Yeah, and and there is a there's research which have been done by companies like Gartner, which says that only two percent of organizations globally find the performance management process truly effective. Yeah, or yeah. providing outstanding value. So yeah, if if your listeners feel that all I am saying is nonsense, they are possibly in the two percent of the organizations. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely makes a, a a lot of sense. So then, you know, when it comes to 
developing, you know, we saw then what was the the trigger, the motivation to think, well, actually, no, this is a solvable problem and I should be solving it myself through technology. Yes. So this was in my last job. I was working with the CEO and the CHRO trying to run the entire technology transformation within HR. There were a few areas where we did find good tools. So, for example, recruitment, we found a very good applicant tracking system. In terms of learning, we found a better than average learning management system. So we did find some good software. We were on one of the large HCM platforms, which we are partnering right now. So the core HCM was good for transactional activities as a system of record. But if you wanted something truly differentiated, then a typical off-the-shelf big HCM will not be able to do that for you. So we were looking at a best-of-breed solution. So a couple of areas we found good solutions. Some areas we were not finding the right solution. So performance management, employee engagement were one of were two of these important areas. And I went to a conference in Amsterdam called Unleash. It's one of the largest HR tech conferences globally, yeah. basically promising my boss that I'm going to find something by the time I come back. And I saw about 25 to 30 different uh, solutions there. And what kind of struck me was either there was this legacy HCM type of model, the oracles, the SAPs, the workdays of the world, where you have something which can be configured, but then you need to spend a couple of million dollars. You need to spend one year configuring it. Yes, absolutely. Or there were these point solutions, which were largely just the OKR version. And there were lots of lots of the OKR solutions. But we were not on OKRs. We were on balance scorecards. And you try tweaking the OKR system to a balance scorecard and it won't work. I yeah, even yeah. had founders tell me, you should not have performance ratings in your organization. It's best practice. And I would say, forget the best practice. Can your system allow me to put a rating yes or no? And the answer was no. Yeah, yeah. So, it was basically system limitation being peddled as best practice. I see, yeah. So so that was the time. So I set up the company while I was still in Amsterdam. I saw the gap between configurability and ease of use. And I didn't find anything that could bridge the gap. Yeah. So so that's how Vsor came up. Yeah, yeah. And so you were developing this whilst in, in that previous role then so were you you building it just for that company or were you looking to take that wider i wanted to take that out i said if we have a problem there's a very good chance more people have the same problem yeah yeah so the initial part of the thinking and the shaping of the product happened while i was still working Uh, so typically my office used to be eight o'clock to six o'clock get back home put the kids to sleep and get back to work. So there would be a second yep. shift from from 9 p.m. to about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. every wow. day. Wow. So, That's pretty full on. <laughs> yes, and it, it it did kind of run for a full year. Wow. That's dedication <laughs> to getting this off the ground then. It's not just dedication. It's also the realization that it is not so easy to build a product. Right. It, it's yeah. like... I throw my clothes into the washing machine, shut the door and switch it on versus I build the washing machine. Yes, yeah. Right, so so the complexity starts kind of hitting you in the face when you actually start building a product and look at all the scenarios, all the things that can not just pass, but also fail. Yeah. So so yeah, it, it was intense work. It was hard work. And and that's how the the initial part of the journey was. Double shifts every day of the day. Yeah, yeah. And while you, were, while you were doing those double shifts, was that just heads down, build something for that duration? Or were you, you trying to get people interested? How are you doing any kind of validation during that phase? Yes, I was I was not building the product. I was building the concept. But yeah, okay. what that involved was very extensive discussions and opinions that I sought from multiple different personas. So it was not that I want to build this product, you, my friend, who's the CHRO of a company, tell me what do you want. That yeah. was just one of the personas. So so we looked at identifying the pain points first. So the pain points of the CEO, the pain points of the yeah. CHRO, 
the employee, the manager, uh, the performance management administrator, the system architect. Yeah. Right. So we looked at all of these different scenarios and each role has different problems that they want to solve. So we had to incorporate all of these different things into the product that we were building. Yeah. A lot of this was still happening in PowerPoint. I see. And is that something that you you felt you had to do because you were trying not just to provide a solution you're you're almost changing the way that they work surely by overcoming the limitations of those tools as you say they were peddling their limitations as best practice so if you're trying to start from the other end start with best practice how did you find those you know concepts ideas were being received so the the first early realization was that there is nothing called best practice there is practice that is best for an organization. And yeah. it depends on their circumstances and their needs at that point of time, which could change. right? Yeah. So the first thing was you need to build something which is very configurable. Mm, we shouldn't okay. be, if, if we are looking at the SaaS space, we shouldn't be looking at a single model. Otherwise, we are no different from the OKR providers. Yeah. So it has to be extremely configurable at the back end. And yet it should not take six months or one year to implement. So, so that was the was the predominant thing. And the flexibility for the client to not just change the process, but gradually go up the sophistication curve. Because okay. a lot of organizations may not want to start with all the processes on day one. There may be yeah. a learning cycle, there may be a learning curve, and, and you would gradually add on the sophistication over a period of time. So I think the biggest realization was how do we make it as configurable as possible? Mm. And how do you balance flexibility, like the amount that can be configured versus the ease and speed of configurability? Because it seems that those could be at opposite ends of the time spectrum and you could almost end up with something that can do anything. But like Salesforce, you need to spend you know tens of thousands of pounds and several months and months of implementation work to actually get there. Right. So it took us a good two and a half years to fix this whole thing. Right. And what we have now, it, it's pretty much an open challenge. Give us any process, any process under the sun in performance management. We yep. can configure it in less than two weeks. Wow, that's, that's in, very quick. In, in most cases, we can do it in two or three days. Yeah. So that, that's the confidence we have now with the system. You, you tell us what you want and we'll get it done. You know, at what point then having, you know, doing this research, the double shifts, then did you actually get to building the first version of the product? I, I get what you're saying about configurability now, but what did that first yeah. version actually look like? The first version looked very different. So yeah. I, and and there, there were lots of changes that happened in the first version itself. So the, the very first version was something which was a disaster. I hired a software services company in India uh, to develop the product for, for me while I was still working. Yeah. So I, I still remember it was mid-December 2018 when I went to the office of this company in India and we signed the contract so that they would dev develop everything. They yeah. said 12 weeks, $20,000, everything will yeah. be done. I said, that's fine. That's not too bad. Uh, the product never got delivered. Wow. Right. Uh, so we had to basically bin whatever they had built and uh, lost a good few thousand dollars. But that yeah. was not the thing. We lost time. And this is something I've heard from a number of founders, including those who went on to develop very successful and large organizations. Somehow we all make this mistake in the first version of the product, especially if we are yep. outsourcing the development. Uh, absolutely. I've seen it a, so, a lot of times. So yeah, so this by the time we kind of realized the extent of the mess that that was there, uh, it was already late 2019, early 2020. We decided to set up our own company. By then, I was out of full time employment, and we said, okay, now we've got to do it. So yeah. uh, we got our CTO in, and we started looking for uh, for team members. Uh, by then, we had already gone to about March of 2020. I think 4th March or 5th March, our first employees joined us. Yep. And three weeks from there, we were got into lockdown. Yeah, yeah. So, Not good. 
So we had some 17 people in the team, none of whom had worked with each other before, except me and my co-founder. So my co-founder and I uh, had worked in the previous organization for about five years together, but none of the developers, none of the QA people, none of the designers, they had ever worked together. And they were not going to office. So we had to kind of explain a very complex product uh, to the extent that a professional services company had failed to deliver it to a bunch of people who had been hired uh, and onboarded completely online. And this was a time when this was not a common thing, right? So early 2020, you're setting up a company with 20 people. You haven't met any of them face to face. And you're trusting them to That's a big challenge. That's... Yeah. Yeah, so, so while, while, that was, while that was coming, we also decided to pivot. And we said, maybe the way people work will, will change over time. So we yeah. started focusing more on more and more on the hybrid working and the remote working elements and capabilities within the product. So we pivoted, we came out with a, with a beta version, uh, I think in August of 2020. Uh, it okay. was later later than what we would have liked to, but given the extent of challenges, I think it was still a fairly good achievement to get it out. Yeah, yeah. and do you think actually while that might have seemed at the time then to be extremely unlucky timing that just as you're trying to get a team together, you're forced where they cannot meet? You know, do you think actually in terms of shaping the product direction, did that do you a favor almost by forcing you into a particular direction? Absolutely. There were three straight quarters where we had zero sales. Yeah. Right. So every client we went to said we can't spend a single dollar. That that's how bad it was. And uh, what that forced us to do was constantly still work on the product, still kept getting people to see the demos, give us feedback and basically work on those. And in fact, one of those discussions basically shaped how our product is different from everything else. So it was a small company, about 20 people who were uh, part of the deal. And the CEO of the company said he didn't find the platform easy. Right. (laughs) And I was like, what the hell? We've taken pride in building something we think is easy. And there's Mm. this guy who says it's not easy. So we were in two minds, whether to basically give up on the client. And uh, it was an early stage client. We were making something like $50 a month from them. So it it wasn't like if we lose them, we are going to be terribly worse off or anything. So there was a choice of kind of letting that customer go and say, this is not the type of customers who, for whom our product is fit, yeah. or listen to them and say, what could be done? So I said, anyway, we don't have too many customers. Let's figure out what this what this person wants. And I asked him, so what is an easy system for you? And he said, WhatsApp. Right. So I said, okay, so if I give you something that is like WhatsApp, will it work for you? And he said, yes, that would make life much easier for me. So... Based on that one instance, we built a feature called Conversations, which is our core differentiator today. Okay. Which is where the whole update doesn't have to happen at the end of the year in performance management. People use text messaging, like you would do on Teams or Slack or WhatsApp, but just use a hashtag and your goal gets updated automatically. And while this happens and makes it easier for people to kind of update their goals uh, throughout the year, we also collect tons of unstructured text, which then gets put through the machine learning and AI algorithms. And we start giving sentiment meters and mood measurement and stuff like that. And this is like completely missing in this field. The the end goal is for, for us to start giving predictive insights to the CEO. Right. Something that absolutely does not exist in HR. Is this based on purely existing messaging within the organization? What kind of data are you looking at for that? Existing messaging only and the use of hashtags. Okay. So the hashtags basically are the aggregators. So we can run enormous amounts of analytics based on what people are talking about, what is yeah. what is going on. So we can show organizations what are the top five or top three trending hashtags in the week. Yeah. Which basically means what are people talking about? Yeah. 
and then basically map the activity on the ground with the corporate level strategic objectives and show the gap. So we, we've, we've built these things and the one year in between where we did not have much success with sales, we just kept building the product and making it better and better. Yeah, and how are you funding it at that stage? You know, were you comfortable and confident to keep it going? You know, whilst you weren't getting those sales and getting that feedback. So we we have stayed away from VC so far. Okay. We we tried some kind of fundraising at some points of time. Uh, it possibly wasn't the right time, or we didn't get the right kind of VCs. Uh, but we had three angel investors who had put in a small amount. I put in pretty much 15 years of my savings into the wow. company. Yeah. My co-founder put in some money as well. So what we what we did was we managed to kind of keep the lights on, uh, bootstrapped. I was doing consulting assignments uh, in the Middle East, making some money to pay for salaries and stuff. Yeah. Um, so so yes, it, it's not been easy. I wouldn't say that it's been smooth sailing. Uh, we've had to do whatever we could to basically uh, keep the lights on. And whether it was consulting or whether it was uh, a small revenue that came in from clients and in between we we had our first enterprise client, hopefully we should be getting our second enterprise client soon. So so yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy, but we kept we kept moving with the conviction that we've got a winner on our hands. And and the only reason why we were so confident is no one we demoed to told us why the hell did you waste two years of your life building it? Yeah. No, that's so, good and good to be continually having those conversations, putting it in front of people and yeah, be willing to honestly assess, yeah. you know, whether this is viable whether this is solving some real pain points and frustrations and we've kept our team extremely lean so we've we've not kind of gone the typical SaaS startup route of building a large team and hiring lots of c-level people and just having lots of people on board so we we've stayed very very cautious in terms of the cost that we are incurring just because we just we were conscious that we are not raising external funds yeah. So we would rather be prudent than be sorry at the end of it. Yeah, no, that make, makes a lot of sense. And in terms of, you mentioned different personas that you you serve and speak to, as well as different size organisations, you know, from SME up to now, enterprises you just mentioned. How have you approached narrowing that focus to both kind of persona type of company and individuals within it, et cetera? So to be very honest, we never built the product for small companies. Right? The right. product was built for enterprises. But the reality of life is that no enterprise will be your first customer. right? So we had no choice but to work with smaller companies initially. Yeah. And we got some very good feedback. We got some good insights about how people are using it. But none of the small companies who came on board were utilizing the application to its fullest potential. Okay. Right. So, so the, and then as, as we kind of looked at the nature of those organizations, obviously we realized it's a different go-to-market strategy. The product needs to be different. And we were not building for the SMB space. Like, so as I said, my background is in HR in large enterprises. Yeah. I don't know how SMBs work. My, I, I don't come from a SaaS sales background where the company is built on the SMB segment. I don't know how they work. So yeah. it's not my area of comfort. So the idea was always to scale up to the enterprise space. And it was only a matter of time uh, when when something would click. And, you know, you need the first three or four good success stories. And then then it's relatively easier. Yeah, absolutely. I can see how you were certainly a better able to understand their problems as well as speak to that enterprise audience in a way that actually makes sense, resonates with them, and then you know build the products yeah. with the capabilities but that it only time. they need. It takes yeah. time to be ready for the enterprise space, not just from a product feature perspective, but from a number of things that that go into the overall deal. Right. So one of the 
most important things for me right now when I talk to enterprise companies is is information security. Right. Yeah, and, and that's not so. If you talk to SaaS companies who work in the SMB space, not too many people will mention information security as being one of their top three challenges. Yeah. Right. But if you have to get in through a large organization, a government organization or a financial services company, you've got to have that base covered. No, Otherwise, no one is going to even talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah. So so we've we've spent a lot of time and effort getting ready from the information security point of view, getting our uh, our support structure, our ticket management structure up and running, because, you know, if you have uh, 20,000 customers in a particular company and they start having issues, we can't be on WhatsApp. We can't be on uh, on a no. call with them solving their problem. So we need a more structured approach. So we've put together the ticket management system. We've we've made sure that from the information security point of view, our base is covered and strong. So yeah, yeah and these were the things we were able to do while we were waiting for the for the right client to kind of turn up. Yeah, I see. That makes a lot of sense. They definitely do require those things to be in place, and you'd certainly fail to deliver to any kind of enterprise customer if you didn't have them in place as well, which is why they need to be so demanding about those. But yeah, I can see how that kind of research time and time taken to find the right fit enabled you to put some of those things in yeah. in place. I think, and yeah, for other founders, that'd be really, really useful to understand that, yes, thing, you do need that in place. The other thing we did during this time was to build up our partner network. Okay. So what we've kind of come to realize is that if you are going to a large organization they already have an oracle or an sap or a workday so there is no there's no reason why they would want to take a second performance management tool yeah so that's where we've kind of differentiated the whole positioning and we we don't even call it performance management we call it performance enablement so we've become partners of these large companies i see they see the value we bring in with our innovation, the whole conversational elements, the AI roadmap, the hashtags that we use. Yeah. And there are clients where we go to where they are very upfront and clear, unless you're part of the SAP ecosystem, we're not ready to talk to you. Yeah. Right. So so we've, we've taken the decision to partner with them rather than even remotely attempt to replace them in even if for, for a single module so yeah we we are going in together and is that a strategy that you see yourself continuing with to be an extension yes. of those rather than trying to disrupt them no always be with them so the, the mindset and the philosophy is to be an open ecosystem player we yeah. don't have any competitors i would say we don't have any competitors everyone is a partner even if right. a, even if a company sells an identical product, I could still approach them and have a discussion on how we could partner. Maybe a different geography, maybe a different segment, maybe a slightly different use case. But yeah. we we always believe we are much stronger when we are together. I see. And I think that's a really interesting perspective to hold. I think a lot of founders probably would jump straight to the let's try and replace them, let's try and displace them. But it's very yeah, they're embedded. They're big systems. They're expensive yeah. systems. They're not going to throw them away and, easily. And you know the the whole point is the moment an Oracle or an SAP would get to know that there's a small little fry somewhere who's trying to replace them, they would throw all their resources to protect their turf. Yeah. The whole conversation changes when we go with them to a client saying. Your need is very, very different from most organizations, or you are demanding more than a typical HCM company is going to provide. And yeah. here is a very specialist firm who will meet your requirements. Yeah. So, so we we had those partnerships with the technology companies, and we also have partnerships with consulting firms. So, because in a lot of organizations, the consultants are in there first, whenever there's change management or whenever there's a new yeah. CEO. So it's it's always good to kind of be on the radar of the consulting firms where they know that there is a solution that exists yeah. and uh, they just bring us in as part of the overall transformation program where they kind of design the, the change management process and the change management uh, template and then it del- gets delivered through our platforms 
I see. And with a platform like yours, then, which is positioning itself alongside those existing products where you're introducing new capabilities, things that weren't possible before, how do you convince them to make room in the budget for this and, and see there being a return on that you know, new investment? Right. Great question. So when we go into these discussions, at least now, right, we are largely going to companies who are already facing problems and pain with their current process. Right. Right. So those companies who say we've got Workday implemented and we are very happy with it. Thank you so much. No further conversations at this stage. Right. Right. But if there is a company which says I've got a large pool of people who are without a computer system and without an email address. They are out in the field. My current yeah. system is unable to make the best use for them in terms of how they engage with, with the HR process. We say, we've got an app. You don't need a desktop. You don't need a mobile email address as well. We can get them to log in through their mobile phone number and, and we can get them to start using your process in a, in a slightly different way. So very much offering them a better option in a combined offering to those existing pain points that are there and to evolving working practices, people being remote, et cetera, as well then. Yeah, exactly. And and some of the legacy systems have not been built to account for these changes that have happened in the last three or four years. You know, going forward from this point then, how do you see this further changing and developing and then how are you hoping to be able to you know, make the most of that opportunity as well? So our approach is to build a ring of talent solutions that go alongside a core HCM. Currently, the problem, one of the big problems is that companies use multiple different providers. Yeah. And each one of those is siloed. So the data doesn't talk to each other. The, someone can also al- already counter that and say, but we have an Oracle or an SAP where everything is together. Yeah, But then they are not the specialist systems. Mm, I see. So we need one system. For example, there are a lot of companies which have a performance management system, which is different from an engagement system, which is different from a recognition system, which is different from a skills assessment system. But when you look at it, there is a very strong common relationship across all of these products. So wouldn't it be better if there is one talent provider who comes and creates a common platform, which then sits as a layer for talent on top of any core HCM. So your payroll and your time and attendance and your whatever employee of records that you want to maintain in the core, that can stay. Yeah. I have run HRMS systems as part of my corporate role. No one wants to change those, right? Those are big, complex changes. Rather leave them unchanged. But then if you layer that with a more usable layer, which is where all your value-added activities happen every day. Yeah. That's what we are we are aiming to build. Yeah, no, I think it's a very smart approach where it's you know, clearly very, very focused on value adding and value creation. And therefore you get to justify you know, your product and how it is essential. Yeah, and, and companies are, are using these products, right? So, for example, take the case of workforce planning. This is an area where there is no good software in the market, literally, which can meet wow. yeah. a, a lot of requirements. I have done workforce planning in Excel all my career. The only reason was I wasn't able to find something better than 60 to 70% of my requirements, Right. Yeah. So you basically feed a system with all of that, eventually extract the data in Excel and finish finish it off in Excel. So, yeah, yeah. So so what's what's the point? Now HRMS companies do not provide workforce planning. They do not provide psychometric assessment or skill assessment. They do not provide recognition. We are building all of this to be able to go to them and say, we've got this layer. Your clients are already using other providers yeah. for each of these. Why don't we go in together and make it one? I see. And what do you think the ultimate goal then of what you're building is? Do you think you will always stand as a brand 
alongside them? Or do you think ultimately you will end up being embedded at a deeper level inside some of these big systems? I think if we do a very, very good job with what we are building over the next two to three years, there would be some kind of strategic tie-ups. Yeah. Right. So we need to prove how good the product is and how good the service is and how clients are benefiting from it. But the benefit of the ecosystem model is that your partners will at some point of time realize the value. Yes. And and then it will become more strategic rather than a, a very tactical or very opportunistic referral yes. system that existed. So today it is a referral system. It's it's a very opportunistic referral system. Yeah. With with most of these, our client acquisition cost is zero. Right. So it's either a consulting firm or one of the technology companies which comes and says, here is a client which is painful. We, yes. we won't be able to customize to their requirements. Can you do it? And we say, of course yeah, we can yeah. do it. So, so yeah. it's it's an opportunistic referral play right now. Uh, for us, there is no cost of client acquisition at all, and um, these being enterprise deals would would basically just kind of help us keep improving our margins. Yeah, in terms of you know advice to other founders serving the enterprise, then what would what advice would you give? Anyone, you know, a different different sector, but still developing a, a SaaS product, looking to to get into the enterprise market. I think the most important thing is to be patient with the process, because you know a typical sales cycle is extremely long. Uh, we've our first enterprise customer took us seven months, which I believe is not too bad. We started yeah. speaking to them. No, we started speaking to them in January of last year and closed the deal in August. The second customer started talking to them in April of last year, and we are in the final stages of information security approvals. Okay. So it takes a long time. process. So so budget for budget for six to six to nine months at least as a sales cycle. Yeah. Um, be very cautious and prepared with the demands of multiple different stakeholders because it's you're not just talking to a CEO or the functional head and meet their requirements. You will have finance, you will have IT, you will have information security, you'll have risk management, you'll have all sorts of stakeholders who you need to uh, kind of satisfy before you can even get a foot in the door. So this yeah. particular opportunity that we are currently working on, we've had a third party risk assessment review where we answered like 204 questions. Wow. There was a information security review where we answered about 350 questions. Yeah. So, so these are complex processes. They eventually make your product much better. Yeah. Because by answering to those questionnaires, you learn a lot of new things and you know what is it that a sophisticated client is looking for. So do invest in the in the peripheral areas. If you have a great product, but you don't have, say, an ISO 27001 or a SOC 2 certification or something that is an independent third party validation, you won't even get a foot in the door. Yeah. At most, you can run a, a small local pilot, but the moment you want to kind of then expand it, all of these things will come. So, yeah. so these are things that, that you need to prepare for. The procurement process is very painful in most cases. They ask for referrals. They ask for actual interviews. Uh, they ask for all kinds of documentation. So that's something that it, it helps if you can prepare for that in advance. Yeah. But but yes, once you get in, once you get a couple of success stories, I think the the volume that comes in justifies the time and effort it takes. Yeah, it's definitely a, a more complex opportunity to get into because of the reasons and requirements you discussed. But the yeah. the payoff is going to be a lot bigger, isn't it, for each customer? Yeah, so we, we are talking about an average ARR of 150K. USD yeah. from a single client, right? Yeah. Now, if you have to make that kind of money on the SMB space, then you your funnel needs to be possibly as big as the Pacific Ocean. Uh, yeah. you, you, 
we if you if you talk about say a a thousand dollars ARR deal, we're talking yeah. about one hundred and fifty equivalent to one enterprise. And yes. to get to one hundred and fifty closures, you basically need to start with a couple of thousand leads and then narrow them down. It's it's a very different ball game. It is. It, it is very different, and I think it's be interesting for other founders. I think to listen to this conversation, and I'd encourage them to think very deliberately about where they want to be because I speak to many founders and they say, oh, we want to start with the SMB, then we want to get into enterprise. I say, okay, that's great. But they almost hope to like fall into bigger customers by accident and I think don't always appreciate what goes into something like that. Yeah, and, and to be very honest, for us, it is very simple that I don't understand the SMB space well enough. Yeah. At some point of time, we may scale down the product into a Visor light or a Visor basic kind of a product, which yeah. could be more appropriate for that segment, and then hire a person who runs the SMB business because it's it's an it's an engine that needs to work. Yeah, it, yeah. it's like when when I was in HR and and I used to run recruitment, I would do the executive search, but I had a very valuable team member who used to do the bulk hiring. Yeah. Uh, it, it's something where we would meet uh, every evening and just look at a status update, but I would not want to go into that person's yeah, shoes yeah. and run bulk hiring. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be in the detail at that level. Yeah. So, so yes, the, we, we could go into uh, the SMB space later on. And I would I would possibly hope and think it would be an advantage if we can carry some good logos before we go to the SMBs, because then that brings in that element of trust and yeah. that element of uh, comfort, which is absolutely the other way around if you're trying to scale up from SMB to enterprise, because the enterprise will say, who are these people? have never yes. heard of them. Yeah, yeah. I imagine then with the enterprise, it really is. But credibility is one of the biggest challenges to solve. There is always a question which gets asked, what's the largest customer that you've served? Who's your largest right. customer? So they always want to kind of match you as an organization against their requirements. And yeah. if they're 20,000 people and you've only served 1,000, they'll say, yeah, you're too small. And how have you been able to break that down? Is it your past experience or is it doing pilots? How have you, you know, found a way in to break that kind of deadlock situation? So we sell in a more consultative approach. We never go to a client selling a product. We always right. start with what's your pain point? Let's figure out if our product can solve your pain points or not. Yeah. And when we get into a discussion that is detached from the product, it's a safer environment for everyone where we are talking about a problem and we're talking about a solution. Yeah. We're not trying to push functionalities. We are not trying to push a product. I think this is the the old kind of consulting habit that I still have, which is yeah. if you have to understand what the problem is before we come up with a with a sol solution for that. So once that problem solution discussion takes a certain stage, we are able to tailor the application to their needs. Mm. So. Typically, by the time we get to the first demo, we've already configured the application to at least an 80%, 85% of their requirements. I see. So when they see something which is directly addressing their problems, the discussion is not so much about who you are or what you do, but it's about now, okay, I can, I think you understood what we wanted to say and you're showing us something that can that can solve our problem yes. and so on. Yeah. I see. So you, you've basically taken a consulting approach to building trust and proving that you know that you've listened, first of all, you've understood, secondly, and, and thirdly, that you you have what is agreed upon to be a you know valid, viable looking solution to those problems. The, the idea is not to, because in an enterprise space, when, when I talk about, say, performance management, every single company where we've implemented the solution, if you look at it, it looks completely different. Yeah. Because the needs are different. The levels of maturity is different. Their objectives are different. So 
there could be a company which says my core objective of performance management is to lead to the development of people the whole performance process there will look very different from say in a bank where i need weightages i need ratings i need peer yeah. reviews eventually because i want to connect this to a bonus pool i think that customization that you you kind of spoke of earlier is I can see as a definite kind of game changer in terms of enabling you to have those conversations in the in the first place. Yeah, and and now we have the confidence that we can. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is we don't have anyone in sales in Bisor. We don't have a sales team. It's just me and my co-founder who sell, if you were to call it selling. Yeah, yeah. So no sales teams. We've spent zero dollars on Google Ads, zero dollars on LinkedIn Ads. No advertising yeah. at all. And is that something that perhaps for other SaaS founders listening, if they're wanting to get in that into, into that enterprise space, you know, would you almost say stop thinking about your product for now? Think of yourself like a consultant for now and, and try and solve their problems. And then the product can come second almost in conversation. I, I would strongly agree with that. Because, you know, the thing is, you may think that Coke and Pepsi make a colored drink that's, that's sweet and is fizzy. Yeah. But, but when you go inside the two organizations and you start looking at the culture, what is it that they're trying to do? What is their orientation towards clients? What is their orientation towards innovation? What is their orientation towards operational efficiency? Yeah. You will find that they are very different. What comes in the bottle looks similar, but what yeah. goes on behind it is very different. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's really, really interesting. I think for any founders considering going into that enterprise market, I would certainly encourage them to to listen to all of the ad- advice that we've kind of talked to in this in this episode, because I think, yeah, approaching it like you're the consultant first and foremost, and then finding out if you even have a solution and then finding out if you even have a product that's part of that solution has got to be key to success, but also then be prepared, as you said, with the other demands and requirements that are going to come with that and expect bigger payouts, but expect the longer cycles as well. So thank you for for sharing these these points today. I think the founders will take a, a lot out of listening to this conversation. It's been really, really interesting to hear your perspective on that kind of enterprise space, but also the the HR kind of insights as well in terms of how you know those big systems, legacy systems, aren't addressing modern needs. So no, thank you for for sharing that today. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to catching up again in in future, finding out how how things have progressed. You know, onboarding more enterprise clients and finding out how the product has has evolved over that time as well. So um, yeah, thank you once again for taking the time today. Thank you so much. It was it was a pleasure being here. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Inside the Scaler. Remember, for the show notes and in-depth resources from today's guest, you can find these on the website insidethescaleup.com. You can also leave feedback on today's episode, as well as suggest guests and companies you'd like to hear from. Thank you for listening.